Crypto is no bueno in Russia. Putin's government banned digital currencies at the beginning of the year. And that has been a headache for Mikhail Piotrovsky, the general manager of the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. He has had to lawyer up just to hold an art auction. His museum is set to sell NFTs of several masterpieces that include a Da Vinci, a Van Gogh, a Monet and a Kandinsky. Most of the sales promotion include big ideas like this gem of a statement that says NFTs are an important stage in the development of the relationship between person and money, person and thing. It's also a possible solution for Piotrowski's museum, which has suffered a 50% drop in revenue from coronavirus shutdowns. But while NFTs could support the arts, what's important to Moscow is supporting illegal gambling, money laundering and terrorism. All things it claims are funded by crypto and pose a threat to the ruble. The Hermitage's legal counsel believes Piotrowski's time-stamped signature could help, believing that putting it on the NFTs is the pathway to navigate Russia's crypto ban. But while it's a key step, it may not be a lock. And that could be why the museum's general manager is calling the sale an experiment, no matter how successful it might be. Art dealer and writer Kenny Schechter joins me now. Hi there, good to have you with us Hello. today. So Thank we've been you. talking about NFTs for a while now, uh, some of us obsessively, I think, but not everyone uh, can easily make a meaning of what exactly that is, especially this new trend now, turning uh, masterpieces into NFTs. Before we delve deeper into what it means and whether you're in favor of uh, this trend, Tell us how this works. I mean, is this just a digital representation? The NFT of a masterpiece is just a digital representation of something physical that looks attractive and that is important physically itself already. Well, you also left out that I happen to be an artist as well and a university lecturer. And an NFT is nothing. If you want to know the full, <laughs> my full explanation or definition of it, it's nothing other than a tool to disseminate art, art of all varieties and stripes. I think it works most ideally when the pieces that are bought and sold on NFT platforms were created uh, digitally. So as far as museums uh, bring NFTs of masterpieces or works in their permanent collections, I think it's absolutely indistinguishable from the way a museum would sell a poster or a coffee mug in their gift shop or a shirt. So in a sense, museums are under enormous financial pressure due to many different uh, situations. The most obvious being COVID over the last year and a half, which devastated the resources of public and private institutions. So in America, where I reside in New York, there are the, the, the guidelines which regard and, and govern museums selling art were, were basically relaxed tremendously over COVID because museums, many, many institutions were on the verge of actually altogether shutting down. So I am much, much more in favor of a museum sell, making an NFT from a Da Vinci or a Matisse or you know, or any masterpiece in their collection or modern or old master, rather than do that, then resort to actually selling the heart of their collection or bits and pieces to survive. So I think it's a godsend that institutions have this opportunity today to digitize parts of their collection and offer it in limited editions as collectibles. Okay, Kenny, so if you had the money, which one would you invest in? The physical version, let's say, of um, Van Gogh's lilac bush or the NFT version of it? Well, I don't think that's a fair representation <laughs> of the situation because, I mean, look, I, would, I love art. I am crazy passionate about art courses through my circulatory system. My kids make art. It's part of the fabric of my family, the way 
the basis of all of our communication and a lot of our relationships stem from a discourse, a dialogue about art. I don't think anyone is faced with a position of, would you rather have for $5 million a Picasso, a great Picasso drawing or a digital representation of that? I don't think that's what we're talking about. And also, I mean, the Uffizi Museum in Florence sold a Da Vinci NFT and it sold for $175,000. As I'm sure you're well aware, the last um, Da Vinci painting in private hand won't get into a discussion about the authenticity of that piece. But even with the authenticity questioned of the Salvador Mundi painting, it still fetched $450 million. So I think, generally speaking, I'm very much in favor of NFTs as a phenomenon, both mar both market-wise and also how it changes the whole power dynamic of the art world. And it offers a great deal of accessibility for artists to promote themselves and to make a living from their works without relying on a very conservative, backward-looking uh, commercial gallery system. And it also brings a whole new audience of buyers. I mean, there's a trillion dollar valuation of, of Bitcoin in the past 10 years or so. And these people present an entirely new future thinking, forward looking constituency to buy and sell art. So I think, you know, other than the, the environmental issues which are being addressed as I speak to you, I can't see any downside to an NFT. Okay, so you mentioned the changing uh, power dynamics in the art world. I mean, this was really uh, the talk of the town perhaps a few months ago, how NFTs you know, were supposed to change the power dynamics in the art world. But now we see uh, the gatekeepers of traditional art market cashing in on the trend and seriously, uh, perhaps dominating you know, most of the uh, situation now. In this sense, do you think it's a bit of wishful thinking that NFTs are still democratic, still decentralized and still the rebellious kid in the art market? I am the rebellious old kid in the art market. But again, I'm going to have to correct you because the gatekeepers, as the, look, it, it would be foolish to think this is some, you know, some situation that makes the whole world a much happier and better and more um, equitable place. It's not that simple. I, I wildly disagree saying the traditional gatekeepers of the art world are absolutely two two years behind uh, the digital gatekeepers. So I think that the traditional art world, which for lack of a better name, I'll call it that, and the NFT digital art world, they're two parallel universes. So yes, it's a fallacy to think that the NFT land is, I call it NFTism, is this kind of like, um, you know, this fantasy or this Shangri-La where everyone has free access. It's not the case. But what is the case is it's an entirely different set of gatekeepers. So it's not the traditional powerful galleries, the biggest galleries in the world, like Larry Gagosian and Pace Gallery and Aquavella and uh, David Zwerner and Hauser and Wirth. These are the biggest international galleries for contemporary art. And none of them has a presence other than Pace Gallery is starting a new platform. But otherwise, the gatekeepers are an entirely different universe which is comprised of uh, Nifty Gateway, Super Rare, Makers Space, mm -hmm. uh, Known Origin. So I think that, look, there is OpenSea. There are plenty of platforms where anyone can mint an NFT. But like the art world, the traditional art world, you need to have an audience. You need to be either known in the art world or known in the digital world or some kind of an influencer or celebrity or athlete in order to permeate the market. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I don't think it's, look, it's not the kind of panacea, it's not the end all for everything, but it's exciting because it's new and it's different and it's an alternative to having to work your way up painstakingly over years in a very exclusionary, very hierarchical traditional art world. And galleries, as we know them, have only been around for 150 years. They really are not this kind of you know system or paradigm or model that needs to exist forever. What I love about Contemporary art is art is a, a reflection of our times historically, socially, economically, and very importantly, technologically. And this is 
you know, Ethereum is the currency of the internet. It's the, it's a whole new, you know, visualization of the internet now. The way that it's it's kind of a default currency, and a lot of wealth is like I said before has been created in crypto, and there's been nothing to buy until the floodgates were open at the end of 2017, and that's why in the last quarter alone, even with a market downturn in NFT sales, the market is still you know, two and a half billion dollars yeah. in the first quarter of this year, as opposed to a fraction of that last year. Yes. Uh, OK. OK, Kenny Schechter, this is really interesting, but I have to uh, cut you off there because we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. We'll have to wait and see where this NFT craze will lead us to. Thank you.